Okay, good morning, everyone. I just want to make sure everyone can hear me. I know I apologize. We were troubleshooting the live stream. So thank you so much for being here. Um, so I just want to welcome everyone to the 17th annual um, My MTSS conference, where our conference theme is working together to build, strengthen, and sustain um, a multi tiered system of support. And I think you are going to see a variety of sessions that really speak to the theme. We've got a we've got a session on just beginning to implement MTSS um, by our colleagues for the Start uh, Grant Funded Initiative. Stephanie Dyer is going to be presenting that session. You've got sessions on intensifying literacy instruction. You've got an overview on Michigan's dyslexia handbook. You've got sessions on early childhood and other social emotional behavioral uh, support type MTSS sessions. So we really truly did try to make sure that there was something to meet the wide range of needs across the state. I would be remiss if I didn't kick this virtual conference off by uh, extending a warm you know, thank you and uh, just platitudes for the conference planning committee. We had a conference planning committee led by um, Melissa Nantes, who's our professional learning administrator, who not only planned this virtual conference, but also planned the live conference that was just a few weeks ago in Lansing. And, um, you know, we just for any of you who've, who've had the gift of organizing and planning a conference, there's a lot of work that goes into that. So I want to just just really give a warm um, shout out and, and gratitude to all the work that they've done. I also want to extend a great deal of gratitude to our colleagues and leaders at Michigan Department of Education who have been very instrumental in helping RTA Center and really all of us work on our scaling up of a multi-tiered system of support. The Michigan Department of Education MTSS leadership team has just been working for a few years now and really honing in on how to ensure that implementation of MTSS is, is able to happen. And it's happening across the educational cascade. So our, our colleagues and leaders who are a part of the Michigan Department of Education, uh, MTSS leadership team, thank you for all that you have, have done for, for us as the TA Center and our educators and leaders across the state of Michigan. I also want to thank our MDE Early Childhood State Team, because you're going to notice in this virtual conference, we have now expanded our MTSS supports to the early childhood setting. And so you're going to hear a session on how to how to support the pyramid model practices and making sure that we're addressing social emotional behavior supports in the preschool setting. So um, that is definitely a new area, and it would not have been possible without um, Kelly Tumakowski, who's our model demonstration and research administrator, and Pat Sargent, who is the Great Start Readiness Program Manager for the work and the leadership that they've provided to the M MDE Early Childhood State Team. So thank you so much for that. Finally, I wanted to give a nod to next year. I mean, you know, um, any... Anyone who's planned a conference knows that you begin planning next year's conference starting now. And we actually are doing that. We are planning a live conference next year. The dates are November 28th and November 29th. And they are they are going to be, we're going to be at the Lansing Center. So we're looking for a larger venue and um, we're going to be uh, live in person it was wonderful to see everyone live in person a few weeks ago, and we look forward to that experience again. So with that said, I am going to introduce our keynote presenter, who I consider a friend, a wonderful colleague. I'm going to introduce to you Nicole Holland Sims, who is an educational consultant and a former special assistant to the Secretary of Education for the Pennsylvania Department of Education. So Dr. Holland Sims is a certified school psychologist who has a specific interest in social justice. She was the 2021 Pennsylvania School Psychologist of the Year. And I do wanna give a shout out as well because Dr. Holland Sims has just 
uh, released, have just published a book with her, with some co-authors titled Creating Equitable Practices in PBIS. And it is something that I, I have just ordered and I'm looking forward to, to reading. So with that said, please join me in welcoming Dr. Holland Sims. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. St. Martin. This is an amazing opportunity. I'm so excited to be with all of you and be back in Michigan virtually. This is so cool for me. Um, and so just, just always appreciative of opportunities that I get to be with educators. And I just want to take some time and just thank you. Just thank you for everything that you do, the hard work that you put in, the long hours that you put in, the dedication that you have. It, it's not unnoticed. And I know in education across the country, we are definitely, we're definitely troopers, <laughs> to put it mildly. And so I just want to honor you and just say thank you for taking time out of your day to spend with us. And also, I want to give a couple shout outs and thank Melissa and Kim and the great people at my MTSS. I'm thinking of Dr. Pano Simmons as well, who I know is a member of the my MTSS family, uh, Dr. Steve Goodman. Just thank all of you for, for the work that you do and for making sure that the state of Michigan is in good hands when it comes to education. And so with that being said, I am super excited to talk to you today about being a guardian of dignity. And what I'm going to focus on is centering collaboration and belonging in systems change. When I thought of the title, Working Together, the theme of this particular conference, it came to mind that in MTSS, we are always often in a team structure. But no one really teaches us how to be a part of a team. We know the structures of it. We know that we have different roles and we know that we have to have action and we have to do certain things. But oftentimes we aren't able to be taught, how do I interact with someone who might be different from me, who has a different perspective than me? And how can we coalesce around an action and make sure that we all are in some type of consensus? And so when I think about working together, that collaborative spirit has to create there has to be a space of belonging for that to take place. And so if you heard me speak before, I think it was 2021 when I was an endnote for this conference, I spoke about being a Marvel fan and also a Disney fan, which I'll talk about in a minute. So I thought I'd keep with that theme a little bit. And in that first session, I talked about the Avengers. And if anyone else follows Marvel, there's a group of people called the Guardians of the Galaxy. And I'm gonna to talk to us about how we can be guardians of dignity and how that connects to that concept of belonging. And so before we get started, I just want to do a little bit of an introduction. And Dr. St. Martin did an amazing job just kind of giving that overview of who I am. And I, I, I gotta be honest, hearing that I have a book that just came out and that she ordered it, that's pretty cool. So I, I gotta take that moment and just revel in it. But just to know a little bit more about me beyond the professional space, I wanted to just share that I'm a wife to Ron, I'm a mommy to CJ, who is five, I'm a puppy parent to Biscuit. If there's anyone who has a golden doodle in the house, Biscuit is a soon to be two year old golden doodle. So you probably know that I don't get a lot of sleep. I'm always running around because he's a busy guy. Um, but those are my three men in the house that keep me so happy. I'm a IUP, which is the Indiana University of Pennsylvania and Millersville University alum. I'm a former cheerleader. I don't know if you can tell or not, but that is something that I'm very proud of. And who did I want to be when I grew up? Janet Jackson. And guess what? I still want to be Janet Jackson when I grow up. And I see that she's about to go on tour again. So I'm going to have to figure out a way to go and see her. And I already mentioned that I'm a Disney fanatic. And so I do all of this because beyond the professional piece, I'm a person. I'm someone that has interests, hobbies, love, family, just like you, right? And part of the work that we do together is human-centered. It has to be. We didn't get into this work just to be technical all of the time. We got into education because we wanted to be a light for others, to help educate other people, and in particular students. And so I like to do this so that people get a sense of who I am 
but also to help you think about what makes you you. Because one of the key components of honoring dignity and creating spaces of belonging and focusing on equity as well as inclusion is to understand people and to humanize their experiences. I would be remiss if I didn't talk about my educational superhero. So when I look at that face and then I look back at this face, I go, oh my gosh, I am truly becoming my mom. <laughs> and so Yvonne Eccles Hollins is literally and has been the wind beneath my wings. She was born in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania and raised in the William Howard Day Projects. She attended John Harris High School. And so I, I take a pause in between this just to share a quick story and, and why this will all tie together as we talk about this concept of humanity, belonging, et cetera. Yvonne, when she was in 11th grade in high school, this was about 1967, she went to a counselor. At that time, we called them guidance counselors. And at that time, she just said, you know, I really wanna be a teacher. That's the thing that really drives me. I, I wanna go into being an educator. And the counselor looked at her and she said, Yvonne, I think you need to be realistic. You know, you, you're living in the projects. You're, all of your family has lived in the projects for, for years. I think you need to put some reality on your goal and go be a clerk down at the state office. And Yvonne sat there and at that moment, she has relayed this story. She was determined that she was going to reach her goal. And no matter what that person that she looked up to had said, she knew that she could raise above that. And that whatever goal she set and put in her mind, she was going to accomplish. And so with that drive and determination, I feel like that has been embedded in me as well. And I'm sure many of us have stories that are similar, where you may have been told, you know, you don't belong in that space. You belong better over here. Or in order to fit in, you need to do X, Y. And so unapologetically, Yvonne said, nope, I'm gonna be a teacher. And she went on to attend Harrisburg Area Community College. In this area, we call it Hack. From there, she went to Penn State Harrisburg. And in Penn State Harrisburg, she obtained her bachelor's degree and went on to become a teacher. From there, she went on to obtain her master's and, and the story can go on. I could spend a day just talking about her story and how eventually at the pinnacle of her career, she became the first black assistant superintendent in the largest school district in our area in Central PA, Central Dolphin School District. Accomplishment, drive, determination in spite of what she had been told because of where she grew up that she couldn't become something that she desired. Her mantra is education is a must and failure is not an option. Because failure is still a learning opportunity, right? And so for her, even though there were bumps along the way and this story sounds like it was, oh, a, a underdog story and everything was roses, it wasn't. And she'll tell you that. But she also will say that I had my faith I had my love, I had my family to support me, to allow me to become who I am. And so I often call her not only my superhero, but my blueprint. And so I'm sharing this story again, to give you some insight into me as your keynote, but also to say, we have such an obligation as educators to change trajectories for young people, that even our words have such power and so even though that counselor was trying to do her best work, because I'm not gonna say that she was not well-intended, in her mind, she wanted to be quote unquote realistic. But at the same time, her words empowered my mom to move forward. And so I think about that as I consider how we show up, the work that we do together, and how these personal stories really can impact and influence the actions that we take. So thank you for indulging me for just giving you a little bit of background. And so I think we have a chat availability and I would love if you could to just put in the chat, what comes to mind if someone asks you to describe yourself? Now I gave you a big, big story, so I'm not expecting that. But I think what are the things that 
really, really resonate with you. When I talk about my son, I get very excited and passionate when I talk about my husband. So being a mom and a wife is important to me. If you want to put in the chat those roles or those characteristics that make you who you are, let's start to learn about each other as we move forward. I would love that. And I don't know if I can see the actual comments, so I'm just going to assume that they're going to flood and make it work. So that is cool. Let's see. Let's see if I can see them. Oh, thank you, Melissa. Okay, great. All right. So I'll be able to see them in a moment. But yes, please keep them coming. If you can think about how you're showing up and what makes you you, that's important. And we'll get to why in a minute. Okay. Passionate. I love it. Compassionate. Yes. Lifelong learner. Absolutely. Supporter. Determined. Productive. Yes. Positive. Yes. I'm loving this waterfall of just, yes, passionate. My four babies. Yes. Absolutely. So thank you for doing that. I just really wanted to get some sense of who was in the space with me, wife, mom, advocate. Oh my goodness. You all are right in line with what we're going to talk about today. And so that brings me to my next piece. These are the learning objectives for today's keynote. Identifying ways that multi-tiered systems of support as a framework for systems change can be leveraged from a human-centered approach. All of that waterfall of describer, of descriptors rather, really speak to us as humans. We're not just numbers on a data table. We have humanity behind us. And so how can we continue to humanize the data that we're looking at as teams, focusing on the work that we're doing from an MTSS lens? We'll also describe the ways collaboration is embedded in each of the essential components of multi-tiered systems of support. And one of the things that I've seen in the, in the Michigan or my MTSS work is this concept of teaming. And so we're going to unpack that as a part of the keynote today. Okay, so for those that may not be familiar, these are the guardians of the galaxy. And there are probably some of you that are going, yes, I can't wait for the next one. If you're a Disney Plus subscriber, you probably have watched the holiday special. I am sharing all of my nerdum with all of you right now. But these are the Guardians of the Galaxy. So you have Groot, Rocket, Peter Quill, uh, Nebula's not pictured here, but Gamora and Drax and all of these different people. And so they protect our galaxy in the comics and in Marvel. <laughs> but they are out there ensuring that we are safe. They're making sure that there's no harm that's coming to us. And they're protecting at the very core humanity. And in this case, the galaxy in Marvel has different types of, of, of individuals. Let's put it that way. They may not be human in nature, but they're all types of different individuals. And they are the protectors of that. Okay? So stick with me. The guardians of the galaxy, they're important because I want us to think about how we are also guardians. Okay? So the first stop in our galaxy, why do we need to think about belonging through a dignity approach in education. You may have heard that we say these terms all the time, equity, inclusion, belonging, accessibility. At the core, where does dignity sit? And so when I'm thinking about dignity and the work that I've been able to research and review from folks like Floyd Cobb and John Cronapple, Donna Hicks, et cetera, folks that are very much ingrained in this concept of belonging, at the core, dignity is always centered. And so I want us to think about dignity in that same way as it relates to education. And so we have to start at the beginning though. And the beginning is that education is a system that has not always been designed for people that look like me, others that have different identities, different backgrounds, et cetera. Think of that story that I painted with my mom and how the system said she should not think about pursuing a career simply because of her zip code or her address. That didn't just start in 1967. That system and structure had been in place a while back. That's the history. So how did we get here? 
Well, we've had inequities in education for a while, as I said, and you can see on that list on the left, there are a multitude. It's not just in one particular demographic. It's not just in one particular area of focus. These are all related to our educational structure. So societally, there's inequities, as we just described, zip code, address, health access. Society creates some of those inequities. Socioeconomic, who has access based on their level of income, who does not. Cultural inequity, culture is very expansive and that's something I would want us to walk away with after today. We're not just talking about ethnicity, race, gender. Culture is expansive too, things like SES, language, religion, et cetera. Familial inequity. So families who have grandparents who are raising children, families who have incarcerated parents, there are inequities based upon some of those dynamics that families have each and every day that we see each and every day. And then as we start to get a little bit more out of the personal of our families, of our system, of our society, we get into the nuts and bolts of education. So programmatically, what programming is available or not available? And are there opportunities to even when access is given, participate? Staffing inequities, we could spend an entire day. <laughs> I'm sure this isn't happening in Michigan, but in Pennsylvania, we are in crisis when it comes to staffing. And it's starting as early as who's picking education as a major when they go to college. So we're seeing that the trend has been there for a while, but I want you to pay attention to that picture on the right. 2020, a spotlight was shined on all of this. And it made it very clear at that point that there were things that were not necessarily available to every learner in our educational ecosystem. Beyond staffing, instructionally, are our neediest kids, our neediest learners, I should rephrase that, our neediest learners receiving what they need when they need it in the appropriate way that they need it. Assessment inequity. I'm a school psychologist by training, and I can honestly say, that in my time as a school psychologist, as a practitioner, I was using assessment tools that were inherently not really favorable for learners who had never seen some of the things I was talking about in the questions. I've shared in other examples that way back, <laughs> the WISC-4 is the tool that I gave. That was an IQ measure. And in that IQ measure, there was a, a question that said, what's missing? And there was a rotary phone. This was 2005, 2006, and seven. Young people that I was evaluating, they had never seen a rotary phone. And so that's just an example of how with our assessments, sometimes they can skew the results and ultimately influence the outcome that that learner receives. And then linguistic inequities. Based upon languages we speak, don't speak, multilingualism, how are we creating spaces where that's seen as an asset and not something that we need to remedy? So that's, that's a nutshell. How did we get here? And why do we have to talk about creating spaces of belonging and it, focusing on inherent dignity? And so my good friend and colleague, Dr. Ronald Whitaker, he has created what's called the HELP framework, which I think is really, really important in grounding this type of work. The first part of this is the H, which is history. So I painted a slight picture in that previous slide about, you know, how did we get here? Are we at, and 2020 really put a spotlight on everything and has changed in some ways how we're approaching the work that we do in education. But history is always important because we know the old adage, if we don't know our history, we're doomed to repeat it. And so in a lot of ways, because we haven't reflected on the history, of education, on the history of society, on the history of our country, sometimes we repeat those things and we make mistakes that we probably could have avoided. And so history is key. And then he moves us to E, which is equality versus equity. So this concept of equality is giving everyone the same thing in the same way without considering that each person has varying needs, strengths, et cetera. Whereas equity, allows for those needs to be um, compensated, addressed, made sure that they are acknowledged 
in a way that allows for opportunities to happen because access in and of itself is not enough. It's the opportunity to actively participate. This next one is one of my favorites. It's the L. And in L, he talks about love. Love not meaning like, you know, love, like I love you so much, but rather the relationship that can be developed or the willingness to care. That's love. And so when we apply history, focus on equality versus equity and ensure that equitable practices are being developed, that love piece needs to be the anchor. And I often joke that I would love to talk to Dr. Dr. Whitaker about shifting love to be the bottom of this framework to really support the rest of it, because throughout it, it's gonna be important in each one of these. But I still, I'm not gonna <laughs> go there, but I still love the framework and sequence that he has articulated. But as you move out of love and the development of those relationships, pedagogy and practices follows next. And in education, we often wanna just jump to that, right? We are change agents. We wanna move swiftly. We see a need, let's address it. So it's tell me what to do. Okay, check. What's next? Thank you, check. Pedagogy and practices is where we tend to live and where we tend to feel most content. However, if we want those pedagogy and practices to have really strong impact, the H, the E, and the L have to happen before we get there. So when people say, I want to shift the culture in my school, I want to change the menu of interventions that are available, we need H, E, and L to get to that. And that's going to look different depending on each structure and each system. So let's say we're looking at a new intervention menu. We need to know the history. What have we had before? What worked, what didn't? Was it accessible and was it available to every learner? And did we approach this work in a way that made sense, that we engaged and put relationships first with families and students to hear from them, and then made sure that the practices were effective? Ideally, that's how that framework can operate. And so as we start to think about dignity, I want you to consistently come back to that help framework. But before we move further, we have to remember that language matters. So I don't wanna take the assumption that everyone is clear on, let's say, what equity means, inclusion, belonging. I wanna unpack those just for a moment and make sure we're all on the same page. And so one of the things that we did in Pennsylvania, and I, I just would love to share this, is we wanted to create that level set around language because we know in education, we use so many acronyms, alphabet soup, terminology, concepts, that after a while it becomes like, ugh, mush in your brain. Wait, what was that definition again? Wait, do we all agree that that's the right one? And so in Pennsylvania uh, in 2021, the summer of 2021, we created this one pager to go out to all of our K-12 spaces not to say your equity definition is wrong, but to say this can be an overarching definition that can help you ground how you experience equity, inclusion, and belonging in your space. And so we had also a concept around perceptions and clarity. Because at the time of this release, this was when there was a lot of discussion and heated dialogue, and in some ways, very uncomfortable experiences that administrators in particular, as well as teachers and other educators were navigating about even the term equity. And so we wanted to acknowledge that that was happening. So what are the perceptions that are out there in the field? And what clarity could we offer? Not to say, here's truth, here's false, but rather, because I can't speak your truth, I can acknowledge that you have a perception and I can do my best to offer clarity around that perception and give you the autonomy to have your most informed information to make an informed decision. And so that's how this, this document was created. And I just wanted to showcase it because again, as we think about how we're setting foundation and the structures of our teaming and the action that we do, we have to have level set and understanding around key concepts and definitions. And why we arrived at that place came from data that um, was really important to us from our Pennsylvania Teachers Advisory Committee, PTAC. And so Michigan may have something very similar, 
Um, but in Pennsylvania, this group was very instrumental in informing policy at the State Department level, being an advocate for teachers, et cetera. And one of the things that the leaders of PTAC said they wanted to do was get more understanding on what is this that PDE is asking us to think about when they talk about equity. And so it was so good. They put out a survey to rural teachers, suburban teachers, and urban teachers, and ask them a variety of questions. And you can look up the report. If you simply Google PTAC equity um, report, it should pop up and you'll see all of the results of their survey. But I pulled one in particular. And that is, what is your personal definition of equity? And interestingly enough, you can see across the board, there were a variety of thoughts about what that definition was. And it also varied from rural, suburban, and urban, which was telling because often when I've done trainings in the past and, and even currently, I could be in a suburban space or a rural space and have people say, but we don't need to talk about equity here because we don't have anyone who's quote unquote different by race. And that's where that definition is important because it extends beyond just race. It extends beyond just religion. It extends beyond just gender. And that is so critical. So having this kind of baseline data was helpful for the department to know what could we do a better job of when articulating what these definitions mean. And so I was able to, to look at the work from Michigan and the work that has been done from the Great Lakes Equity Center, et cetera. And in speaking to uh, Dr. Pano Simmons uh, in the work that we do and, and other work across the country, and this definition really resonates. What is equity? And so when I take a look at this, it talks about a multi-layered approach, not just giving students what they need. As you can see, it dives deeper. Policies, policies have to be equitable. Dr. Heather Bennett, who is a really good friend of mine who used to work for our Pennsylvania School Boards Association, she said that equitable policies, if not shaped by families and communities, are all for naught. Because it's important to have that voice at the table to make sure that those policies will impact the people that need it the most. So when we think about equitable practices, we extend that to policies, interactions, our interactions with each other, our interactions, remember that L in love, resources, allocations that are representative of, constructed by, and responsive to all people so that each individual has access to, remember it's not just access, so this is the sequence, access to, meaningfully participates in, that's the opportunity, and has positive outcomes from high quality learning experiences. Regardless, of individual characteristics and group memberships. Comprehensive definition, says it all really. And yet we still are struggling to get there. And why? So we have to get to the root of those things. And at the root, what I believe and what I've seen others say is it starts with spaces of psychological, emotional safety, where we can have those tough conversations to get us to a place to put these practices, policies, interactions, and resources in action. So how do we start? It begins with inclusion. And so inclusion as defined by Cobb and Cronapple is as follows. It's defined as engagement within a community where the equal worth and inherent dignity of each person is honored. So what does that mean? Essentially that means I may not agree with everything that Kim says. Kim may not agree with everything that I say. We may come from two different trains of thought. We may come from two different backgrounds, but at the end of the day, I see Kim as human and Kim sees me as human and I honor the dignity and humanity in her. So that it's okay to have that cognitive conflict. It's okay to not always be in sync at all times, but the inclusionary space allows for that conflict to exist and to be worked through because the dignity is still there. And an inclusive community promotes and sustains a sense of belonging. So we can't get to belonging until inclusion is really something that exists. And so in special education world, which is the world I came from, when we hear the word inclusion, we often think, okay, general ed setting, 
special education setting, et cetera, how do we include more students in a particular setting? This is way more expansive in the concept of inclusion needs to happen in every space in our educational structure. Not easy to achieve. And I'm not saying that you will just snap your fingers and inclusion will happen, but it's getting to this paradigm shift of your mind that at the end of the day, I may not agree, but I can honor your dignity. That's inclusion. Also, as a part of inclusionary efforts, we have to understand the distinction between identity diversity and cognitive diversity. Understanding that diversity in and of itself is not enough. Diversity is in this space right now. If each one of us had the same color eyes, there would still be cognitive diversity that exists. Because cognitive diversity is just what I described, different perspectives, different backgrounds, different ways of life, different values, different goals in life. All of those things happen in any team. Doesn't matter what the identities are, cognitive diversity is still there. And so as we talk about inclusion, we have to recognize that. So when we say, oh, we brought this, this family to our team meeting so that they can be, we can have more diversity. That doesn't mean much if you only brought them in simply because of the identity that they had. If the space doesn't change, and I just saw this quote, if the space doesn't change when we brought in someone, then we have not achieved inclusion if we're not willing to change and adjust. So there is a difference between simply having diversity and full inclusion. That brings us to belonging. And that is experiencing appreciation validation, acceptance, and fair treatment within an environment. That's the ultimate goal of this definition. But I love this second part. When people feel that they belong, they aren't distracted and worried about being treated as a stereotype or a singular part of their multidimensional personhood. I always breathe when I read that because that is me when I read that. If I can feel as though I don't need to be constantly emotionally consumed with whether or not I'm speaking too loud, whether or not I am perpetuating a stereotype of any kind, simply being a Black woman, that is important to me. And without that worry, I can show up authentically and feel content and comfortable enough to be myself, to express myself, and not feel like I have to shrink in order to be a part of a group or an organization or a school, fill in the blank, whatever place that you sit in. Because I'm not just singular, right? I'm not just black, I'm not just a woman, I'm not just a Christian. I have multi-dimensional pieces that make me who I am, just like each of you. And when you listed the things that describe you, passionate, your four children, being a lifelong learner, those are part of your personhood. And if we don't create spaces of belonging, people, youth all the way up, birth on, will try to shed a part of themselves in order to fit in, a part of that multidimensional personhood in order to fit in. That's huge. And so the value of belonging is here. I'm just gonna ask you for a moment, you don't have to put it in the chat unless you feel comfortable enough, to describe a time you felt the need to change or hide something about yourself, to conform, or to achieve something in order to gain acceptance or feel good about yourself. Some of us may have never have had that, you know, have never had to worry about how they show up. Whereas others of us, it's a constant. And in some schools, some learners and youth and students feel it every day, right? So belonging is just as, poor, as important as access. It's just as important. So when we talk about equity, we can't lose belonging in the conversation. Give me all the access I can take. Give me all the opportunities I can take. But if I don't feel like I belong here, why should I care about the access and opportunity you're giving me, right? What is belonging uncertainty? Belonging uncertainty is this 
thought this concept of, I don't quite know if I fit in, I'm just not sure. So I'll give you a brief example. <laughs> so let's say, and I'll use Melissa this time. Melissa invites me to a Christmas party and she says, hey, Nicole, I would love for you to come to this party. Just show up. We just want you to, to be here. We would love for you to join us. I'm excited. Sure, I'll be there. Now, if you know anything about me, I can be a little definition of extra. <laughs> it's the cheerleader in me. Um, and so I may show up to Melissa's house in a full length ball gown or sparkling Mickey Mouse ears or something that is so different, but yet authentically me, right? And I show up and everyone else is very casual, very much comfortable, and I look like the odd man out, right? And now I'm watching some of the nonverbals in the room. You know, the little whispers, the little looks, the things, the looks between two people. And now I'm uncertain. Now I'm unsure. Am I in the right place? Because I clearly didn't get the memo. That's belonging uncertainty in a very easy example. But this is happening in your offices, in your schools, in your organizations. This is happening every day. And it's not just because, right? It's not just because of ethnicity, background, these could be personality quirks, like I said, that make you feel like I don't quite fit in. And in order to fit in, I need to just kind of shed a part of me and not show up as me. The next piece that I want us to think about is that in education, and a lot of what I'm talking about comes from belonging through a culture of dignity. I always shout out Cobb and Cronapple because their book was a game changer for me. They talk about in education in, in America, that our priorities are backwards. And I want us to sit in that for a minute. We are very hyper-focused on achievement, test scores, outcomes, retention, recruitment, and we don't think about why those outcomes are why they are. Belonging has to happen in order to see that achievement. But yet, we have not thought about that in a very intentional way. And when I say we, I mean collective we. I know some of you do think about this on a consistent basis, but collective we as an educational field often don't think about this. And not even the educational field, society too. So that macro system, micro system, meso system, I probably put them in the wrong order, but that system, those systems, have those priorities in a specific way. And so the book articulates Maslow's hierarchy of need, right? They also point out that Maslow never intended for this to be a pyramid, as we often see. And we got to give a, a clarity too. Maslow obtained his work and his theory from indigenous people. So let's call that and name it. And then let's think about this. So sacrificing belonging for access. So as we take a look at what we typically have seen in Maslow's hierarchy, to get to self-actualization, typically belonging should be up there, right, in that staircase. Because what Maslow intended is that we can move up and down on a staircase at any given moment, from physiological to safety to achievement to belonging. We've put achievement above belonging and then expect someone to jump a step <laughs> and get to self-actualization. It's impossible, right? So we have to think about why that can impact us moving to that place. So let's let's move out of students for a minute and let's talk about when belonging is dipped down like what you saw, when it's absent almost from an employee perspective. Let's talk recruitment retention of educators. What Wilkinson says in her book around the diversity gap, she talks about the emotional labor and psychological toll that when belonging is absent, adults feel, right? So remember I talked about that consistent uncertainty, the labor of trying to make sure my voice isn't too loud, make sure I'm not being too extra. That's emotional labor and after a while taxing enough that you say, I can't do this anymore. There's also the pressure to perform perfectly, 
When I speak about that lovely woman at the top of my presentation, my mom, one of the things that she instilled in me, and I'm sure there are others on here that can attest to it, she taught me, Nicole, you must stay 10 steps ahead of everyone else in order to be seen, recognized, and acknowledged. 10 steps ahead. Pressure to perform perfectly because there's already an assumption that I'm going to perpetuate a stereotype or not live up to what people expect from me. And then constantly navigating assaults on dignity. We're gonna talk about what those are in a moment. But when that is absent, these are the things that can happen. And so we wonder in some ways why we can't recruit and retain certain individuals to our educational field or why students say, I'm better off not being in school. I'm just gonna, just gonna drop out. These are important. And so we have to put belonging where it belongs. And as we look at that staircase of Maslow's hierarchy, you notice belonging is so close to safety because safety is not just physical. And I know you know that. It's emotional, it's psychological. And so belonging has to be close to that in order for someone to feel confident and competent enough to get to a place of, I do, pardon me, I do want to achieve. I do want to do something that makes me feel like I have a purpose, which then gets us to self-actualization. So let's take a pit stop. <laughs> so collaboration corner, that was our first round of the galaxy guardians. I'm telling you that right now. So that was a little front heavy and I understand. And so I want us to start thinking now, now that we have that level set and that grounding, how we are showing up with our colleagues, with our families, with our other vested partners. And belonging cannot exist without understanding the importance of dignity. And I'm gonna unpack that in a moment. And so as, as I'm doing that, I want you to have this question in your brain. How can we build effective MTSS teams that are centering equitable, inclusive outcomes in the context of achieving belonging? So they're all interrelated, right? but belonging is the goal here. And so let's start with the 10 elements of dignity. This comes from the book that Donna Hicks wrote called Leading with Dignity. And so you've heard me mention Cobb and Cronapple, Belonging Through a Culture of Dignity, which is very K-12 focused. Donna Hicks' work is a lot of where they obtained a lot of this information about how dignity can be a piece of the educational understanding of belonging. Donna Hicks really comes at this from a leadership perspective across corporations, across entities, et cetera. She articulates 10 elements of dignity. Acceptance of identity, right? So being able to show up authentically as me, identity is multifaceted. Recognition, acknowledgement, inclusion, all the things we just talked about. Safety, fairness, independence, understanding, benefit of the doubt and accountability. That's how dignity can be honored in people, right? Not easy to do, but necessary. So let's unpack a couple of these. Independence, that means autonomy. That means that I trust that you have confidence in knowing what you're doing, that I may not know it all. And I love when someone said they're a lifelong learner. That's humility. I'm constantly in a state of learning. I'm constantly acknowledging that there are things I could be learning more about, doing differently, changing, et cetera. 10 elements of dignity. Donna Hicks goes on to say that when we honor others' dignity, we strengthen our own. That's powerful because it's not just about, yeah, I guess I gotta be nice now. No, it's about acknowledging that someone has humanity right? You may look different from me. You may not agree with me. We go back to that. But at the end of the day, you're a human and I'm a human. And at the core, we have dignity that no one can take from us. Remember the old Whitney Houston song? No matter what they take from me, they can't take away my dignity. Truth, okay? Because dignity is a birthright. Respect is earned. That's another Donna Hicksism. <laughs> Respect is earned. Those are things that you you get over time, but at the core, each of us is born with dignity. However, on the flip side, 
Remember I talked about the emotional and psychological toll when belonging is absent and how people have to navigate assaults on dignity? Hicks would say, when violating dignity, we're tempted to do this with people. We're hardwired, evolutionarily, <laughs> we're hardwired to do things that violate the dignity of others or when our dignity is violated, react. And so she talks about, I gave you 10 elements, now I'm giving you these 10 temptations. Taking the bait. The reason I'm unpacking these is because when you're sitting at those tables as an MTSS team, as a leadership team, as a PBIS team, whatever the team you're sitting on, in a collaborative shared ownership space, violations to dignity will happen. Not a matter of if, they will happen. And we have to be able to recognize teammates when those violations might happen and how we might be able to address them. So let me unpack a few. Taking the bait, this is essentially what it means. Someone violates my dignity, I take the bait and wanna violate that dignity back. So eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. I take the bait, I engage in further violations because mine has been violated. The second one is saving face. So now I am doing my best to push off what just happened and preserve my dignity, or the person who violated is now trying to preserve their dignity. We're both saving face. We're pretending nothing happened. Shirking responsibility. Oh, I didn't mean it that way. I don't know how you took it, but I didn't mean it that way after a violation of dignity. These are interesting to me, depending on false dignity. Essentially, depending on the accolades or the acknowledgement of others to make us feel like our dignity is valuable. When that happens, we never quite feel like we have worth. So depending on false dignity can be a violation because you're never able to feel like you can be authentically you in a space that your dignity won't be violated. Maintaining false security, right? So false security just means, okay, if I'm gonna stay in a relationship, in a team, I feel good because they make me feel like I'm the best thing. <laughs> so maintaining false security in this space, not showing up authentically, reserving who you are so that you can stay secure in your position right? Avoiding confrontation, self-explanatory. I'd rather not talk about that. Let's not go there. All of those. Assuming innocent victimhood. I can honestly be honest with all of you and transparent. I've done this. I've done this. I can't believe that they said that to me. I haven't even done anything. Not being self-reflective and acknowledging the part I may have played in that exchange. Resisting feedback. Someone gives you feedback and immediately you become defensive or what? I can't believe they thought that. Okay. I'm giving brief examples for time's sake. Blaming and shaming others. Well, that's not on me. That was that team who decided to send that student up from elementary school on this level. Right? I know you've heard it. Gossiping and promoting false intimacy. So let's say we're all on a Zoom meeting together and someone makes a comment and I take a look at someone else in their Zoom box and they have a, a look after the comment is made and I do what we all do and text that person and say, I saw your face, what, what in the world was that? And we may not even be that close of colleagues, but now we've developed a false intimacy because we're gossiping, making remarks, et cetera, about something. I'm not saying that we're wrong. I'm saying these are the temptations that we do that violate dignity and can create spaces where action really could happen, but won't because we're stuck in these violations. Teams fall apart, people no longer want to be a part of them, et cetera. And that's why dignity at its core shapes all of the other things we've been talking about. And so Cobb and Cronap will say, when we look through the lens of dignity, equity comes into clearer focus, right? In order to get to that place, we have to start with dignity. It answers the questions, why? Why are we doing this work? On what foundation are we building? 
And what's our goal? What are we working for? With that lens of dignity, we can start to articulate those answers in a more clear way. And so they offer a dignity framework. So I offered a framework at the beginning from Dr. Ronald Whitaker, the HELP framework. I want us to almost overlay that with this framework. They, they go on to talk about the dispositions that are needed for dignity, empathy, patience, openness, listening. The indicators for belonging then are appreciation, validation, acceptance, and treated fairly, right? So in order to get to those indicators, the dispositions have to be there. Sounds simple, not simple at all, right? It takes time, it takes effort. And we're gonna talk about in a team, like an MTSS type team, what we have to do to get to these pieces. We also need to think about what are our standards for dignity? To ensure that we're getting to those indicators of belonging, we have to build partnerships, right? That's the love, the L. We have to repair harm and restore those relationships. We're still in the L. We have to affirm differences and uniqueness, that equity versus equality, the L as well, and then presume comp competence and positive intent. This one is hard for some of us because sometimes, I have to be open and transparent. It's hard to presume positive intent when someone has violated your dignity. The goal is to get to a place where I have enough understanding about you, your story, your humanity, that I will automatically assume you're coming from a better place than what I assumed in the beginning. And again, that takes time. It's not an overnight. But we know that there are distortions to dignity that can get in the way. And it's important to name them and acknowledge them. Judgment, apathy, intolerance, mistreating others, dismissing others, degrading difference, blaming and shaming, dominating, taking up all the space. So the voices that we probably know we should be listening to, we're not hearing them because the space has been taken up that goes back to those violations. So I just want you to kind of see the crosswalk between how we can apply this in education and how Donna Hicks has applied it from a human space, human-centered approach. And I love this example. When students are treated with dignity, they feel safe to be wrong because everyone sees themselves as equally vulnerable individuals working on becoming their authentic selves. That is the value of using the lens of dignity in education. That was from a student. It was a student response to a teacher who was using the dignity framework, dignity approach as part of her history course. That's profound. And again, I'm, I should never be shocked when young people express themselves in a way that's so open, transparent, clear, because they do it all the time. It's just a matter of us listening to them but I thought that really captured what we're talking about here from a student perspective. It's safe, keywords, safety, vulnerability. We're all working together, right? We're working together on becoming their authentic selves. And what does Maya Angelou say? When we know better, we do better. And knowing can be multifaceted. Knowing yourself, knowing others, knowing a structure, knowing how society moves and functions, when we know better, we do better. And so how do we honor dignity in ourselves and in others? Donna Hicks, again, articulates the following, and I really appreciate these. They seem easy, they're not always. Authentic listening. This means <laughs> while someone is talking, sharing, whatever the case, I am authentically in tune. I'm not thinking about what I need to cook for dinner, what I need to do after this meeting. I'm actually intentionally taking in what is being said. I'm also not listening and formulating the response, right? Something we all do, we've all probably been guilty of it, but we're authentically sitting in it. We're developing trust. And that is a key word. In our teaming structures, that forming, storming, norming, performing, Trust has to be at that forming and norming space. 
Also, when we get to storming, trust becomes even more relevant because in the storming space, it's gonna get a little ugly, right? So we need that trust to know that we'll get through this together, the conflict's okay, and we're gonna push through. We have to encourage vulnerability, right? That goes with trust. I'm not always going to feel comfortable telling my story in front of people if there's not a level of trust there. Engaging in empathy, knowing that I may not fully understand what you're talking about, but I'm listening. I can try to take perspective and step in your shoes for a moment, but I may not fully ever understand. But I have empathy enough to know that human to human, you have an experience that I could learn from. I don't feel sympathy. Sympathy would mean I pity you. I have empathy for what you are experiencing, for who you are, et cetera. This next concept is brilliant to me. Go to the balcony. <laughs> Go to the balcony, meaning we're in a discussion. It's getting a little intense. I'm probably violating dignity. Someone else is probably violating mine. The work that we're talking about is to go to your mental balcony and look down over the situation and say, okay, maybe I need to step back. Maybe I need to close my mouth for a minute. Maybe I need to evaluate who all is around me and whether this conversation should continue here or be somewhere else. It's that self-reflection, that self-awareness of going to your mental balcony. And I love that concept because each of us has a balcony that we need to go to. And when we're sitting in teams and we're talking about data and we start to get into the blame, shame, their parents live in this neighborhood, their dad never shows up, X, Y, and Z, we need to be able to go to the balcony and look down on that meeting and say, where is this going? Are we downward spiraling or are we making things that are within our control happen because all of those other things really are none of our business? Going to the balcony. And then owning responsibility. When I violated someone's dignity, I need to own it. I need to be okay with saying I was wrong. <laughs> that's not easy to do. But that's how we not only, as Donna Hicks said, honoring the dignity of others, we're honoring the dignity of ourselves as well. Important, right? Okay, guardians. <laughs> We've taken a lot of detours. We're in this galaxy of protection. I want you to get back on the path with me. How do we actually put this into practice? That's the meat, right? I've given you all the front load, all the theory, all the thought. And now I want you to think about, okay, Nicole, thank you for all of that. But now what, right? What I don't want us to do as we're navigating this galaxy is fall into traps and tropes, okay? And so I articulate this for you because it's easy to do. It's very easy to do. And it's necessary for us to make sure that whatever practices we put in place, we're aware that we might be moving into a trap or trope. And we want to, as much as we can, navigate that and avoid it. Like we say when people are flying, evasive maneuvers, evasive maneuvers, get around it, get away from it, do it the right way, right? Traps and tropes. This comes from the work of Jamila Dugan who with her co-author Shane Safir wrote the book Street Data, a next generation model for equity pedagogy and school transformation. If you've not read that book, please, please pull out that book. There's also an article, I think in educational leadership um, that Jamila wrote that articulates these same, these same rather traps and tropes. For sake of time, I'm not gonna go one by one, but I do want to highlight these for you. And you probably are gonna say, yep, we're doing that, <laughs> or we're close to doing that, or I'm so glad we aren't doing that. And that's okay. This is for you to do your own inventory and figure out, are we potentially getting close to one of these? So the first one is doing equity. We could substitute equity for PBIS, MTSS, fill in the blank on frameworks, systems change, et cetera. People will say we are doing X, Y, Z. What doing equity as a trap or a trope is described as is treating equity as a series of tools, strategies, compliance tasks versus focusing on whole person, whole system that are really linked to culture, identity, and healing. Healing is a big word. 
Remember that H in history? Sometimes that restoring and repairing relationships that we saw in the dignity framework has to be a part of the healing process. And if we're just simply saying, yep, we purchased this curriculum that talks about fill in the blank, that's not doing the full scope of the work. Siloing equity, right? Locating equity work in a separate and siloed policy team or body. Now, a lot of you may say, well, wait, we have an equity team or wait, we have a leadership team. Nothing wrong with that. The issue with that is if that team is always off to the side, has no real authority, never connects to any of the other work that's happening in the building or in the district, then it's siloed. And so that's a trap and a trope that simply allows for that team to just get frustrated because they feel like they're doing work, but they're not moving anywhere because they're not connected to anything else that can support them. I wanna take a moment and just put two of these together, the equity warrior and tokenizing equity. So the equity warrior, nesting equity with a single champion and holder of the vision. Again, we could substitute blank warrior for any of our concepts that we have in education and saying, well, you know, that's Nicole's stuff. So just give that to her. That person, let's say that person resigns, moves on, finds another position. What happens to the work? Capacity hasn't been built. So now the holder of the vision is gone. And the vision, without the vision, we can't move, right? This kind of coalescing connects to tokenizing equity, where you're asking leaders of color, again, add components of multitude of identities. It could be leaders of different gender identities, leaders of different religions, leaders of different fill in the blank, to hold, drive, and symbolically represent. So they're simply there to be a face. Been there. Transparently. Been there symbolically representing equity without providing supports and resources. That island mentality. So not only are we talking about siloing a team, but it might just be a person. Or becoming having that person becoming the warrior and they may not have even asked for that, right? It may not be their level of expertise. It may not be something they're interested in doing. And we assume it because they fit a category, right? Spray and pray equity, engaging equity experts to drop in for a training with no ongoing plan for learning or capacity building. I share this uh, as a story. I was uh, asked to speak at a, a local school district in Pennsylvania, asked to give a keynote for the return of teachers to the year. So you know that opening when everyone's in the auditorium, et cetera. I was asked to come and do that. And so the assistant superintendent said, yes, please come and we wanna hear what content you're gonna share before you share it. So that was kind of like, eh, not quite sure why, but okay. And so I, I gave them a, a dress rehearsal, et cetera. They were fine with it. And at the end of the dress rehearsal, the assistant superintendent said to me, you know, Nicole, we do recognize that we have brought in the cliche black chick to talk about equity. And I didn't know what to do. And what it made clear for me in that moment was that I was gonna do a spray and pray. Because what essentially he was conveying to me in violating my dignity, let's go back to that, was I was a checkbox, right? This is a hot topic, we're bringing you in, but we really don't have any real plan beyond you. We don't have any teachers or, or leaders that you know probably will engage in this in the same depth that you want to talk about. Spray and pray equity, doesn't work. Okay, I'm getting, <laughs> I'm getting down to the wire. I could spend all day talking about this. Um, but some more traps and tropes that I think are important. Naval gazing equity and structural equity. So naval gazing is when you're constantly in this space of self-reflection and yet we're not doing anything on the system side. We're just coming together. We're talking about our experiences. We're explaining how society has been, what history has been, and we're not applying it to how we can then take action. That's navel gazing. Structural is the, the opposite of that. We're so focused on the system that we're not taking the time to reflect and go deeper and be personal and talk about what's necessary for those shifts to happen. So again, traps that we can easily fall into. 
for sake of time, I'm gonna keep moving. But this last one, boomerang equity, is one I've seen all too often. Investing time and resources to understand your equity challenges. So we bring in a consultant, they do an equity audit, they tell us what we should be doing differently. And we look at the results and go, yeah, that's not gonna happen. We don't have the money. We don't have the board support. Duh. We'll just go back to doing what we've done. That's boomerang equity. Traps and tropes that we can easily fall into. So when we think of the practices that we need to do, Lauren Miscaran, yes, I hope I'm saying that right. I always hope I'm saying that right. She wrote a book called Evident Equity. Definitely recommend that as well. And she talks about having a heat map. Remember I said, guardians, we're on the galaxy. We're moving through the galaxy and we need to know how we can get to these spaces to be guardians of dignity, right? So this heat map can help us. So organizational equity is the first stop. And what she says is get close and specific, get proximate. That's the term which I love. Meaning who are the people, who are the groups, who are the communities that are most needing the supports that we're giving and are we making sure they're getting them? But beyond that, have we talked to them? Have we had a conversation about what it is they think they want and need? That's getting proximate. So which inequities are personal, local, and immediate? And what is within your locus of control? What can you, with good conscience, have control over? And decide on one to two equity goals. Don't try to bite off the whole elephant. It's impossible. One to two. Once we move out of organizational equity, if you take a, a little dive with me over to the right, we're moving into shared equity. So that's building a coalition, a coalition of the willing, a guiding coalition, a group of people who are on board, not that equity warrior by themselves, a team of people. And we're building their capacity to develop strategies for either turning up the heat or turning down the heat. And when we talk about heat, <laughs> we can really be talking about a variety of things, but let's say, we need to start moving on some things. We're navel gazing too much, or we need to slow down. We're moving too fast and we're missing things, turning up the heat, turning down the heat, and then consider multiple entry points to build that coalition. Don't get everyone who has the same thought as you. Get some different diverse, cognitive diverse people who are gonna challenge you so that that coalition has longevity and it's responding to all of the people that are being served. Next up is structured equity, work the system. We don't need to create a new team if we don't have to. Utilize who you have and think about how you can leverage that team to start combining and connecting the work in a way that makes sense. And in those connections, make sure that the voices of those we have hardly heard from, marginalized, minoritized, et cetera, that they're centered and that we do take time to listen. And then last, evident equity means living it out. Business as usual. This is just what we do here. How is equity living and breathing all around you? And it's more than words, right? So this map organizationally is where we start. We get to a shared space, we structure it out, and then it becomes evident. Sounds easy, not at all but we still need these markers along the miles to let us know where we're moving, where we need to get to and what goals we should be setting. So that brings me to your lovely graphic from the Michigan Department of Education, which I just, when I saw it, I went, it's a pinwheel, it's amazing. And so where I wanna focus the remainder of my time with you is on the orange piece of that pinwheel. And that is tim team, rather, team-based leadership. It starts there. It really starts there because that team is doing then and informing then all of the other colors in that pinwheel. And so that's why working together is so important. Centering collaboration, shared ownership in the concept of belonging is so critical because if our teams aren't functioning properly, if our teams aren't healthy psychologically, emotionally, that's going to permeate the rest of the practices that follow. And so the definition of team-based leadership is here. It's an active, organized, knowledgeable, and representative group that exists that provides whole child supports. Remember how important that was? When we talked about doing equity, we don't wanna just do equity. We wanna focus on wholeness of people. 
removing barriers, coordinating and evaluating activities for the district in alignment with the broader education system. I heard Dr. St. Martin say that we have early childhood folks in the room. I don't want to neglect you. This type of approach is from birth on. So even if we had higher education folks or post-secondary folks in the space, and in Pennsylvania, our Department of Education is inclusive of libraries. That's why we call it an ecosystem because all of us are learners in this, in this realm and team-based leadership extends beyond K-12. And so the contribution to the desired outcome would be that teams are collaborating, communicating, contributing to these really key words that I just would love to have in big bold letters alignment and cohesion, not siloed, not just doing the flavor of the month, but putting these pieces together. When that happens, the leadership team can create sustainable, scalable, and engaging school climates to support successful implementation of MTSS and learner achievement. That's team-based leadership. That's from your Department of Education. That's big. That's big that that's defined and the desired outcome is that. So kudos to Michigan for that. How do we embed what I've just talked about for the past time that you've been listening into a structure like that? I've intentionally embedded resources, books, things that have informed me, and this is no different. Five Practices for Equity-Focused School Leadership by Sharon Rad, Gretchen Jenneret. There's a number of other authors that are noted there but they talk about this concept of an equity-focused leadership team model. They put four routines for equity-focused leadership teams. So remember we talked about what team-based leadership is. You have to expand and strengthen relationships. That means take the time to get to know your teammates. Yes, we are in a professional setting. Take the time to know about my dog, Biscuit. Take the time to know about my son, CJ, and what makes me happy and smile. I saw my four babies in the chat. Expand and strengthen those relationships. And then think about who's not at the table that we should bring in and strengthen those relationships too. With that, transform the use of power. Power is a big word. But what that essentially means is I'm not going to be vertical down. I'm the expert, I stand in front of you. You all on this team need to listen to me because I'm the equity warrior. Transform that power is throughout the space, horizontally, because each of us bring a level of expertise to something that's relevant. Integrate personal experience with systems and trend data. And so how do we look at the data that we see, whether it's societally or in our structure of, of school or a building, and say, yeah, that data says that, but that's not been my personal experience. It's okay to have those things coexist and still both be true. So what they say is integrate that. So even if the data says that African-American boys are more likely to be suspended for disrespect, and I have an African-American son, and my son has not yet received a, a suspension for disrespect, because my personal experience doesn't match that data doesn't mean that these two things aren't true, right? So how do we integrate both to say, while my experience may not match, I still trust that that data is accurate and important for me to acknowledge. Assess the credibility of data. And so essentially what we're doing is asking ourselves, is this data confirming what I thought? And have I, whether we think we do or not, selected data to match what I think? And am I able to change my mind as a result of the new data that I've been shared, that I've been shown rather? That's assessing the credibility of the data. That's the four routines that are so important. Not only that, we have to think about the roles of our teams. We know that we have a note taker, a timekeeper, et cetera, all well and good, don't get rid of those roles. I want each of us as members of a team to think about the roles that we can inherently take on at any given moment in a meeting. So we may, and they intentionally put educator number one because we're constantly in a space of learning. So I may be an expert in one thing, but Kim may be an expert in another and she's educating me and I'm educating her throughout the meeting. We're also leadership practitioners, meaning there's not a structure or a script for leadership. We're constantly learning as we practice. We're equity champions because we are centering that 
in every decision that we make. And the decision-making is always ongoing and not just with us as the holders of the information, but decision-making that's collaborative. And so where do we go from here? I want you to think about that, guardians. Are you guardians of dignity? Think about that. As I've unpacked this, I can't say right now I'm a guardian all the way. I'm still learning. I still make mistakes. I still violate dignity, but I can be a guardian in the making, right? And so that's one of my favorite characters from Guardians of the Galaxy, Groot. And so Groot would say, I am Groot. And I would say, I'm a guardian, right? And so I leave you with this quote and you see my lovely family over on, on the left. Uh, we just came back from Disney, believe it or not. And this quote comes from Amanda Gorman, for there is always light. If only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. And I'll just offer my information as a connection. Um, please know that the book that Dr. St. Martin referenced is being released on December 20th. So it'll be a stocking stuffer if that's what you celebrate. Um, but please, please consider that as something you would be interested in. And please follow me on Twitter if you're still on Twitter and LinkedIn as well. And you can also visit my website for more information. I have about three minutes left and I'm gonna answer a couple questions and then give you the code for us to close out today. So one question is, how do we effectively move from the reflection to the application? Our team is stuck in this mode. Wow, yeah, so um, that is a very good question. <laughs> I would say you need to be very in tune with what it is your team's goals are. So if the team's goals are, we wanna get to a place where we see a reduction in, let's say, um, restraints. We want to see a reduction in restraints for students in the self-contained classroom, etc. If we continuously stay in this reflective mode, we will never get to that goal. So we have to create spaces where we're, we're doing qualitative and quantitative work, right? Evaluating the data that we have, having some reflection around it, and continuously keeping that goal at the center. That would be my advice. It takes time for people who probably have never had the opportunity to have a space like this, to give them that space to have, because it may actually make them more productive in the end. So that going slow to go fast is valuable. Another question is, how do you go about starting to repair any damage when dignity has been violated? Another excellent question. First off, it's being able to, if I'm the violator of the dignity, being able to self-reflect that I did violate. And sometimes as the violator, we have no idea. And so I would encourage us, whether we are the person in receipt of the violation or the witness to the violation, to say, can we have a sidebar conversation after this meeting and explain, not speaking for the person who was violated, let's say if you're the witness, but bringing attention to the potential violator. That is a way that you potentially can begin the conversation and sit in that conflict. And the book that I referenced around the four routines and the roles really speaks to giving strategies on how to sit in conflict and that it's okay for that to happen. Okay, question. How do we support adolescent learners and honor all the complexities and beauty? I love that. Oh, wow, I love that. Young adults bring with them. Right, and they are complex. And we've all been there as adolescents, that you're navigating so much difference and so many things that you're learning about yourself at the same time. I think listening to them is so critical. And I know that sounds very simple, but having spaces where they can feel like they can be themselves, talk openly, that's how you can learn your best effort on how best to support them. And it may not be in a circle where they have to be vulnerable in front of everyone. It could be an anonymous type thing like Mentimeters. <laughs> There's all types of things, Padlets that you can use and have them start to articulate some of the things they're feeling and, and understanding and experiencing. And that can be helpful to us as educators on how to not only address them individually, but they're probably not the only person feeling the same way. So you might be able to do a lot with just one or two uh, pieces of feedback. 
it is 10.01. I want to be very respectful of the time. And so I'm going to uh, put up my slide deck one more time because I do have the code. Uh, but I do want to thank you for your time and for all of the things that uh, you have put in the chat. If you've been keeping up with me, I would love to continue to connect with all of you. And thank you again to my MTSS for this opportunity and enjoy the rest of the conference. And let me pull that back up. Hopefully I can. I know everybody loves the code, right? Okay, and I need to share the screen again. Yeah. Okay, thank you for your patience. And hopefully you can see that. Perfect, okay. Thank you all so much. Okay, I'm going to take this down. Thank you very, very much.